Chinatown, there are 807,000 buildings in the city of New York. Um, that's the number of buildings you used to get water into and sewage out of every day. Um, and so far, with the numbers I heard, we've got solar on top of 3,200 for some of them, which means we've got a lot of solar to go. Um, the other thing, though, which gives me some hope, is in the early 1990s, we did the city's water conservation program. And the city of New York today uses 35% less water, 400 million gallons a day of water less than it did in 1990. One of the big elements of that was to run a toilet rebate program. We changed that in the city of New York, in case this kind of trivia interests you, has about 4 million toilets. <laughs> and we changed out 1.4 million of them in 18 months through a well-designed rebate program. A uh, number of features of which are being incorporated, including the kind of grouping and community outreach that is being done here. So the challenge for New York as a city, we need a lot of small decisions. We need these small decisions to coalesce in some big programs, um, some very big programs. Now, if we could change out 1.4 million toilets in 18 months, which meant we were in about 150,000 buildings, um, we ought to be able at some point, particularly with the kind of energy we saw here tonight, to do this with solar. So I, I set that up for our panel. I set that up for some challenges. Um, before we take questions, I'd like to ask each panelist if they'd like to comment on the other presentations they heard. Aiden, is that the right way? Aiden. It should be better at Celtic time. Well, I think it's really interesting, especially to have first um, Chris's presentation of small scale um, solar panels. We're talking about installations that are like three kilowatt systems, where ours is a hundred kilowatt system. Oh, sorry, five hundred kilowatt system. Um, so just to hear the impact they can make on a one household is, is really um, interesting to me. Um, and then to hear all the potential of how it could spread throughout the city is really exciting from what we were talking about. Um, yeah, I was uh, very impressed with the, the other two presentations. We, we work very closely with, with Chris, so I, I get to hear a lot about uh, his projects, and they're you know, getting more exciting every day, I think. Um, but hearing about AD's work, I think, is, is even more exciting for me, because I think we, you know, I deal a lot with solar, and so it's, it, it's really exciting to see other renewables taking off in the city. Uh, solar is just one piece of the whole energy puzzle. And, uh, and to see a wind turbine in New York City now, I think is just uh, you know, really thrilling, and I hope we get to see a lot more of them soon. Yeah, I would just uh, start with uh, AD's presentation. I'm, I'm familiar with uh, Sims and spoken with uh, um, the owner of the company, uh, or Matt, senior, yeah. Uh, and I think one thing that's really important to point out about that is that it's interesting to look at what they're doing, and you can sort of quantify that in terms of how much energy they're saving and green energy they're producing. But I think the really important thing there is the precedence that they're setting, um, which is the huge battle for distributed generation, as, as Aideen had mentioned. That's the first one of those in New York City. And to get that thing built and to show that it can be done, the value of that precedent, I think, is more than any of the kilowatt hours it will produce over its, uh, its operating life. And that's the way this works. It really is about making it happen, uh, going out and building it. And no one put a gun to uh, since recycling. To, to do that, and it's just something that they elected to do. So that's uh, that's hugely significant. And I, I work with Jeff all the time. Uh, he was a very modest definition of what an ombudsman is. I think there's very few people as knowledgeable as Jeff who have to deal with so many different pieces in the solar world. So we're really fortunate to have him. He's a major asset to the work that we do in the city. One question I'd like to ask the panelists is, clearly if we get to a point where we have solar on 100,000 buildings, we're going to change the nature of Con Ed. Um, I'd be interested in your comments on how you see the future of Con Ed. Well, what I think is fantastic about distributed generation is it forces the moment. You know, it's not like putting, uh, feeding electricity into the existing system. As I tried to say in my presentation, it's disruptive. Suddenly it's, uh, people able to do this and it's taking electrons away uh, that are normally sold to us uh, through the distribution company. I don't think that it means uh, Con Ed's uh, extinction. I don't think that it means that utilities go away. I think it redefines what they are rather than being 
um, basically sellers of electrons from wholesale distributors, um, the value that they have is that they're a network, uh, that they're actually able to connect to all of these folks that are generating power from distributed sources and balancing the grid. So I think their role will change. I think that the way that regulation is very quickly, it didn't come up as much tonight, but New York is at the center of a massive regulatory change that's really historic, of really trying to change how utilities work. So I think they'll still be around, but I think that their, their role will be greatly changed. But again, I like that solar sort of forces the moment as it grows, I think, and kind of forces them to change. Yeah, so the, you know, the proceeding that Chris mentions is called reforming the energy vision. And you know, it's really exciting because New York is, is at the forefront of, of tackling these problems uh, here. Um, and so the, this initiative is, is looking at, at what the future of, of the utility is going to be and also what the future of the grid is going to be. Uh, the goals of reforming the energy vision uh, are not just to make the grid more sustainable, but also to make it more resilient, to make it more market-based, to make uh, consumers better able to participate. And so the, you know, the complex name that the Public Service Commission gives to that is a distributed system platform provider, uh, which is kind of a mouthful. But uh, you know, what, what that means in reality is that you know, the, the utilities aren't, aren't going away, but their role is going to change. They're going to be enabling uh, consumers to participate in distributed resources like solar uh, in ways that they can't, can't now. They're, they're going to be able to participate through things like energy storage. <laughs> And you know the grid's not going anywhere. People are still going to need power when the, the sun goes down, and uh, and even with energy storage, you're still going to need uh, a grid to make sure that you have backup power. But that relationship is ch is changing, and, and it's going to keep changing. And I think New York is is really at the forefront of that. So it's exciting, and it's going to be uh, things are going to be happening quickly. The the state has a very ambitious agenda for it, and the picture is really only just starting to take shape of what it's going to look like. But you know, come back uh, in, in six months and, and you'll hear more details and it's going to be changing uh, even more quickly after that. Um, so from our experience, uh, now that we're producing enough energy that um, sometimes we put, we're put in a situation where suddenly we're drawing a lot more from the grid if, if our energy isn't producing as, as much as it can. Um, it's interesting to put Conan in the position of, wait, now they owe us money back and um, so just to see that transition and to see them have to take on more of a role of um, distributing the energy that we have available from many different sources would be really interesting to see how their role changes over the next few years. You know, we're, we're giving a sort of an optimistic view of their, of their future, but one thing I will say is that we can't expect the utility to be leading the ideas at all. And I'll just give you a cautionary tale for them, is if that's not obvious enough, but you know, if you look to Germany, for instance, uh, when that feed-in tariff was put in place that we referred to that hyperdrive solar, we look back at it and you think that that was a war against utilities. It wasn't. The utilities were in the best position, actually, to take advantage of it. There's no rule that they couldn't participate. But because of their own inertia and their own ability to see things differently, they could only look through the rearview mirror, you know, as they were going forward and think that the past was the future. And they missed the opportunity. And they're literally going bankrupt at this point. The utility death spiral is probably a much longer phrase in German, but that's where it, it came. So anyway, the, I guess the, the point I'm trying to make is that we need to push the utilities. Don't expect the ideas to come from them. That's actually a good lead into a comment I wanted to make, which is I think 50 years from now, when the economic historians come to write the history of this period, they're going to look at the energy industry, not only the fossil fuel companies like Exxon and Shell, but to the great centralized utilities and say they were idiots. Now, why do I say they're idiots? Because if one looks at their kind of position, their historic position has been to be empowered to be our energy providers. Now, they have an enormous amount of resources, although the crash in oil prices is happily pulling some of that back. Um, if I were running one of those companies, I think I can honestly say that I would be trying to get into green energy with every dollar, every dollar I could come up. That is, instead of fighting the future, um, I've been following the so-called war on coal that the Republicans keep trying. Um, I would not be fighting the future, I would be trying to take control of the future and use my money to maintain my economic position 
as the you know as the energy marketer of the future. The but I think Jeff, I think the comment you just heard is right. Institutional culture is an enormous thing, and people have an enormous amount of trouble changing things. I can tell you when I did the watershed program in the city, nobody in the, the program was never with watershed protection a good idea. Nobody believed you could do it. I don't think anybody, there are very few people in the country who can be found to say renewable energy is a bad idea, but they can give you all sorts of reasons why it cannot be done. But the truth of the matter is it can be done, and it will be done, and the energy and utility companies have been making an incredible blunder by not leading the charge. Now, for those of you who are following the disinvestment debate, many of the people who are against disinvestment are arguing that it is important for us to stay in fossil fuel investments because it gives us a seat at the table. Well, my answer to that is, all right, if you've got a seat at the table, what are we going to do with that seat? <laughs> And it seems to me the important thing to do with a seat at the table is to say that these companies have got to get out of this business of the past and get into this business of the future. Because their lives would be far easier if they did not have to, you know, and kind of is not the worst utility, believe me, uh, if they did not have to dance around some of these people, cajole, convince, argue, throw some bones, um, you know, I deliver their goods into the hands of, you know, as, uh, I told my daughters, always remember reluctant bridegrooms make lousy husbands. Um, and we have some very reluctant bridegrooms in the fossil fuel and the energy business. So that was a great lead in. I just wanted to kind of drive that little point home when we think about grand strategy. Okay, I think it's time for some questions. Okay, thanks. Um, so you asked first about the idea of zero waste. So the one NYC, the new plan on NYC came out, I think, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, and they made some bold um, uh, goals of reaching zero waste. Um, There's some interesting phrasing there. They said 90% diversion um, from landfill. So that doesn't exclude incineration. Um, still about, still all of New York City's waste is going to landfill. I'm uh, sorry, to incinerator, um, to a place in, in Newark. Um, so we might see more incineration instead of landfill. Um, but then hopefully there'll be more recycling happening, of course, that's always the goal. Things like we expanded the plastics recycling program two years ago to uh, include all hard plastics. Um, so that has increased the amount of tonnage we're getting by 10% over the last, over the last two years. We have 10% more than we did before. Um, so that's great. Then the idea of single stream so all across the country, communities are moving to single stream recycling. That can really increase your uh, participation rate. So uh, yeah, putting all your recycling into the same bin. That can get a lot more people participating. It's a little bit easier. Um, it does really degrade the, the quality of paper. Um, so it's, it's a debate that's happening all over the country. The mayor's office has made the decision. They feel like it's worth it, that the increase in participation will balance out with the degraded paper. Um, we'll, we'll see. We, still, I mean, we just finished a dual stream facility, so it'll be a huge change to our operation, a many million dollar shift. Um, so it won't be happening tomorrow. it would be a few years off still. Um, but yeah, uh, maybe I'll hand off for the second part of the question. So the question was about uh, the market-based nature of REV versus uh, renewable portfolio standard, or? Right. Well, you know, I think, and the state is obviously still sorting some of these issues out. I, I think, you know, the two aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. And, you know, to give an example, something like energy storage. Currently, uh, a commercial building could um, install a battery and, and actually get a return from just having that battery through programs like demand management. So they'll um, reduce their electric demand uh, at times that it benefits the utility in order to reduce their, their charges, or things like what they call the ancillary services market, basically helping to support the grid. And it, those aren't currently available to residential customers. So if, they, you know, if a residential customer wants to get um, Tesla's battery storage system, uh, you know, it's not quite as easy to, to get a return on that, uh, except for what you, whatever value you place on, on resiliency. 
uh, and being able to have the you know emergency power when when the lights go out. Um, and so you know one of the, the goals of Rev with the uh, market-based structure is to allow more participation in these types of technologies. And, and so that doesn't necessarily mean that there will be a you know a, a, what they call a tariff for. Um, battery storage, but it's one of the things that they're looking at, and, and uh, trying to enable more participation in these technologies through through markets. But just simply having that doesn't necessarily mean that the state can't also set mandatory uh, goals through an RPS. Yeah, I would say that just also real quick is that what I like about it, and I'm, I'm not nearly smart enough to really understand the nuances of it, although I've, I've tried, but I think um, what it is, it's sort of a first step to making the utility from a reluctant bridegroom to a more eager bridegroom. It's meant to sort of redesign the incentive structure so that utilities will be compelled to support distributed generation. And what I also like about it is it's the first step of valuing distributed generation for the benefits that it actually gives to the grid, uh, which is something that's blind right now. There's tax credits and things like that. And things like that. What if the, the, the driver of these were actually us saying, oh yeah, solar is good for the grid, let's put a price on that. So to me, it kind of, it, it, it's, that's a positive step, I think. So we make over a dozen type of commodities. It can vary month to month, but usually over a dozen commodities. Um, every type of different, we separate plastics into at least five different types. Um, each type of plastic will be sent to a specific factory that will use that stuff to either make um, plastic pellets that can be a base material for another type of plastic product, or sometimes we sell directly to manufacturers. So someone like a pipe manufacturer, um, they might use old milk jugs to make a black pipe that would carry sewage or something. Um, really, there's an endless amount of things that can be made out of what leaves our facility. Um, in any given month, we're selling to at least 20 different companies um, based on who has the most competitive prices, um, but yeah, so it, there's really many things that can be made out of it. Um, all the stuff that we're selling, all of our commodities, they're going somewhere on the East Coast to uh, factories that are making the plastic pellets or making um, new products. And then in terms of outreach and education, um, so we do a very small portion of that. We have an, our education center at our facility. So if any of you want to come visit, you can come see the operation. You can. Um, go onto our overlook and see the facility, see the, the big piles of recyclables, see the equipment, um, and know that it actually is happening, which is kind of a nice thing to, to see. Um, then, so Department of Sanitation, and in conjunction with Grow NYC, they do most of the uh, recycling outreach. So they have people going into schools, um, seeing how they can improve the diversion rates from cafeterias. They have people going into apartment buildings, working with supers. Um, making sure they have the right labels for their uh, bins. Of course, there's a, lot, there's a lot more that can be done. Um, it's just a big challenge. I mean, there's you know, 8 million people. Yeah, um, I mean, they so they do have that apartment building um, outreach program that they go in and they, it's mostly targeted at the, the building supers because they're the ones who will get the fines if, if something happens wrong. So they do kind of leave it up in that respect to the supers to make sure you know, if they're penalized, hopefully they'll distribute the information to the people that they um, live in their building. Um, there's plenty of mailers that go out. I mean, yeah, of course, there, there is more that needs to be done. Um, it's just very hard when there's 8 million people in the city. So. I have to tell you, in my building, which I will not identify, um, one of the things the supers tell people is that lots of the stuff we recycle gets sent to landfills anyway because the city can't absorb it all. This does not actually encourage people to be very precise about how they recycle. I don't know, I'm sad in passing. I think um, there are many problems with the city's problem. Uh, I'd love to talk about single streams some other time. It, this is an interesting comment because the, the complaints I've heard about smart meters is about their costs. Um, there's a big rate proceeding up in Orange and Rockland County um, where the local utility, whose name escapes me, wants to offload the cost of these on consumers. And the question is whether the consumer will get enough benefit. Um, the argument against them is that um, most consumers are not graduate economics students who are paying attention to their smart meter every five minutes and playing with their smartphone. 
to manage their bill that they do it in much cruder gear. I had some dealings with the whole issue of radioactive stuff when I was the P commissioner. Um, there were a lot of allegations that our stuff was going to create various things. Um, it was interesting because I used to offer to shield our, to measure radiation before and after and then shield our facilities. It's very interesting that those offers were never taken up. Um, so that the question, so it was clearly that something else was going on in the way people were responding to this issue than, than rationally. I think, it's, I think it's a very, very tough issue. Um, the issue sometimes reminds me a little bit of the debate over vaccination, frankly. And the, but I think it is, I think it's important that we air this question much more importantly. What I think both our, our speakers were suggesting is you're going to have a much different relationship with the grid in the distributed energy world of the future. And it's something we really need all to understand very carefully. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, what we do um, is we work with co-ops and condos and multifamily. Um, it's challenging with uh, apartment buildings where there's renters currently if you have your own individual meter because that system on top of your roof is not going to be able to link into every single type of meter. Now, if you have a shared solar type of policy that was talked about, which then maybe would allow renters to subscribe or link into a portion of that energy, uh, that solar system on their roof. The other issue, too, that often goes with certain types of multifamily buildings, in general, the taller you get, the less roof space you have to sort of spread out among all of the, the, the different users. Uh, so there's not necessarily a ton of solar energy that's being produced that can be distributed you know, among, uh, among the tenants that, that live in that building. So that, that is a challenge with, with vertical buildings. So. Sure, so I, I guess the fir first point is that the 90% you know, of uh, installations being commercial is, is not true in a per installation basis. So currently of the, you know, the 3,200 installations uh, that I mentioned are, are on rooftops in New York City, it, it's pretty much about 500 or so, or a little bit more than 500 are commercial. Um, and then you know, the remainder are residential. So the, the number in, in terms of on a per installation basis are much more on the residential side than the commercial side. In terms of the actual uh, capacity of the solar energy that's installed, it's, it's more like 50-50. And that's because you have big installations like the, the 600 KW one uh, that they have. Uh, and there's another, you know, there's another uh, big one up in the Bronx on the Jetro cash and carry that's over a megawatt. Um, so those help to make up the difference from the, the small number of actual installations. Uh, but to the, to the question about financing, um, currently, uh, New York offers a program called Green Jobs Green New York, um, which offers subsidized uh, loans for solar projects to uh, both residential customers and, and commercial customers, uh, small commercial anyways. Um, and so this program is really great because it offers uh, something called on-bill financing, which basically means that you can pay back the loan uh, with a surcharge on your utility bill. So Kanye doesn't participate in that? Uh, yes, they do. It's, oh, they said a couple months ago they don't, and they won't. Yeah, I, I, all of the utility, the investor-owned utilities in the state are, I think, required by law to participate. And I know that um, Comet has done some uh, Green Jobs Green New York projects. Um, but, uh, but you know, to the to the broader point about financing, currently, actually, the small commercial market sometimes has a harder time getting financing uh, than the small residential space, and, and there are. Um, Broadly across the nation, there are a bunch of financing options for single-family single homes um, that allow for the kind of zero-down uh, financing uh, that I mentioned uh, during my presentation. So th there are definitely options out there, and they're and they're increasing. And actually, you know, the the biggest part of the market currently that is kind of having a hard time finding financing is the smaller commercial, and that also bleeds into the uh, the multifamily market. So in addition to the challenges that, that Chris mentioned um, with splitting up meters, financing can be one of the biggest hurdles for uh, an apartment building. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So 
Panels typically come uh, with two types of warranties. One is a, a production warranty that covers uh, basically the expected energy that's going to be produced over the lifetime of the panel. And those are typically 25 years. The panels will often last longer than 25 years, but that's uh, kind of the standard industry warranty uh, will be a 25-year production warranty. The second warranty is, is for the equipment itself. So basically, if the, the panel just breaks, and the, the standard for that is about 10 years, uh, although you can find um, certain financing offers like a lease that will uh, cover you for the entire 25 years. So it, it depends on, uh, on the financing mechanism that you choose in terms of the warranty. In terms of the actual performance, um, you know, the data says that solar is, is pretty durable because there are no moving parts. Uh, there's not a whole lot of maintenance that's required. Um, Oftentimes, you barely need to even wash off the panels. You can kind of rinse them off every once in a while, but um, they're pretty self-sustaining. And like any uh, product, you know, you'll find variation from manufacturer to manufacturer. Um, so that, you know, there is some variability there. But uh, if you're shopping for solar panels, I, I would look for those two warranties and make sure that um, you, you know you're going to want them both to be to be long to be covered for the full lifetime of the panel. And so just to compare, so our facility, our installation, our plans were that it would last 25 years. The one major um, upgrade that we'll need to make at some point is the inverter that converts DC to AC energy that we'll have to switch out. Um, really the plan is just to do that once and then annual additional cleaning just once per year. Um, that's really the only maintenance and upkeep that we're planning to do for the next 25 years for our installation. Just one quick comment on that is that the inverters typically will be warrantied for uh, 10 to 12 years, uh, but there's kind of two typical inverter setups you can have. One is a central inverter um, for all the, the panels, and then you, you can also find micro inverters where you have one small inverter for each panel, and those are oftentimes warrantied for the full 25 years. Well, it's been a good presentation. It's identified the fact we still have some questions left. I hope you can waylay our two remaining speakers on the way out, but with good guests, we have to be ready to go by nine, but I think Edie would like to close the meeting.